Welcome to this afternoon's session, Bank Document Subpoenas, Tales from the Field. Uh, I think in the program, the rhetorical question is laid out, do banks lie when served with disclosure orders or subpoenas for documents in connection with a fraud and asset tracing and recovery inquiry? Um, Ed Davis, my, my good friend, says that the mother's milk to fraud investigations uh, are bank records, payment records, uh, customer balances, the debits and the credits that go into a bank account. Um, and that is not an understatement. It's central to every fraud case I've ever worked on uh, uh, in terms of recovery is to move to the scene of the apparent fraud, gather the payment records, see how much value is uh, uh, perhaps uh, removed uh, in an unworthy fashion, uh, measure the size of the problem in terms of value, see where value went so we can begin the, uh, a forward tracing process uh, and, and at the same time, do some reverse tracing from the point of the suspected uh, responsible party or offender's uh, address or where he's located, uh, how he expresses dominion, power, control over value, and do reverse tracing through bank records from that point backwards in motion or movement. So dual, tra dual directional tracing is critical in most asset recovery cases of any substance. But they all relate to getting bank records. And the, one of the biggest problems we face in fraud investigations is that bank records, in theory, have a limited lifespan. Um, when you serve, in, in today's modern system of banking, a disclosure order on a bank or a subpoena, uh, frequently, as fraud recovery lawyers, we're facing a temporal, a serious temporal problem. If some of the core facts of the case relate to documentation that is older than five years, or six years, or seven years, depending on the case, many, many, many cases require historical records that go beyond five or six or seven years. And we get letters back, usually from the bank, when we're asking for older records like this. In the state of New York, uh, when you serve a sub subpoena on a New York bank, you get typically a form letter from the subpoena compliance department of the bank. The letter says, dear sirs, thank you for your subpoena. Um, <laughs> We advise that you are seeking records, it appears on the subpoena, reaching back to 1997 or 1998 in connection with this matter. New York State banking regulations from the superintendent of banking uh, require us to retain records for no more than six years in the state of New York, as I recall. And therefore, uh, this is the requirement that we, we have, and here are some records that we have that are more recent than six years, and period, the end, and that's it. This is a major problem when we get these letters. Now, my colleague, uh, Arnie Lacayo, is with uh, Ed's firm, uh, ST Griaga Davis, here in Miami. Uh, Arnie's focus is on financial fraud and recovery matters. I have the pleasure of working with Arnie in many cases. Uh, he's represented governments, uh, large classes of victims, uh, uh, liquidators, trustees in this area. Now, Arnie has very extensive experience with Chapter 15, which is the U.S. version of UNCTRL's model law uh, on uh, transborder insolvency cooperation. So we take, perhaps, if we act for uh, uh, an insolvency office holder from Brazil, there they're called judicial administrators. We come to Miami frequently, because there are records here usually, and we ask Arnie, Pre please petition the U.S. Bankruptcy Court to recognize the powers of investigation and asset recovery of the trustee or the JA from Sao Paulo. Uh, or we're using a tool called 28 U.S.C. Section 1782 in the United States, open square brackets, discovery in aid of foreign litigation, a crucial tool in our work. But why? Because it's a, it's a broad tool. Uh, unlike uh, disclosure orders in, uh, under English law, where phishing is allowed, uh, not in the English system, but under 28 U.S.C. 1782. Any documents uh, or evidence reasonably calculated to lead to admissible evidence, which is a big, broad berth, are available under this provision. And all we need to show in a petition is we have a foreign proceeding. 
that exists or is imminently contemplated to be instituted. It could be, uh, well, in some districts in America, it could be arbitration proceedings, some not, but certainly court proceedings, fair game, come to America, and they've opened the shores to discovery, all full, broad U.S. federal discoveries available here, depositions, documentation, everything. The other crucial thing about America in fraud recovery is U.S. dollars. U.S. dollars are settled through Fedwire or CHIP in New York every night. These are five money center banks, and they offset debits and credits, baskets of debits and credits all over the world. So when a businessman in Karachi is paying for goods purchased from a businessman in uh, Islamabad, uh, if they're trading in U.S. dollars or uh, 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 another country, let's say in Switzerland, in U.S. dollars, uh, there, is, there are two accounts, one client account in Karachi, one in Zurich. And if they're in U.S. dollars, and many, many trades, most trades in the world across borders are in U.S. dollars, if they're paying electronically, the payment will be settled in New York between money center banks acting as correspondents for the banks in Switzerland or in Pakistan. That means there are records in New York showing the wire transfer activity between those two business people. That means in New York City we have uh, huge access to data and the money center banks when we serve 1782 subpoenas ask with a list of names of suspected offshore companies, onshore companies, targets in an inquiry for records dealing with money transfers. So America is a very important place for gathering payment records to help further uh, an inquiry. Uh, Arnie, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Martin. Uh, some of the funnest cases I've worked on, I've worked on with Martin. For uh, those of you who were here for the prior panel, you know that Martin does very interesting work, and so it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Martin said, we are going to discuss um, briefly this afternoon uh, the challenge that we face as lawyers looking for bank records uh, in matters that have long histories. And uh, as Martin also introduced, um, the, the topic is related to our subpoena power uh, here in the U.S. or, or the disclosure order uh, uh, in the common law system. Um, I will begin today briefly uh, for the non-lawyers in the room by giving a very brief overview of how subpoenas work here. Um, and essentially, when you're talking about a subpoena, you're, re you're talking about a request being made with the power of the court uh, under our rules here. Uh, the lawyer issues the subpoena uh, and signs it, uh, but uh, it's, it's